Um, and as always, this recording will show up on the YouTube page in about a week after uh, tonight. All right. And next, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Pavarsky. Um, and let me give you a little intro about her. Dr. Melanie Pavarsky is an associate professor of mathematics and the chair of the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science, which includes degree programs in actuarial science, cybersecurity, and information assurance, data science, and information technology at Roosevelt University. Her research interests are at the intersection of probability and analysis, where she studies heat kernels and their applications in metric measure spaces. She has also published in the scholarship or publishes in the scholarship of teaching and learning mathematics, uh, writing about and engaging mathematics students in active project work in venues such as um, the Book of Mathematics for Social Justice, Resources for the College Classroom, and Scientific Science Education, Civic Engagement, and International Journal. Recently, she has been collaborating with biologists from the Field Museum of Chicago and leading her students in data analysis projects based on the community science data set. This led to a joint publication with students, alumni, scientists in the Open Access Journal, RIO. She earned a PhD in mathematics from Cornell University and worked as a visiting professor at Texas A&M University. She's a National Project Next Fellow and a PI on the NOICE uh, NOYCE grant, which supports development of highly qualified math and science teachers for high school schools, high need schools, and is a member of the Chicago Symposium Series Planning Board. She previously served as a Center Leadership Fellow and as a director at a large for at large for the Illinois section of Mathematical Association of America. Um, and also, since we're talking about Roosevelt University, um, we want to give a shout out for them for thinking uh, for hosting us today. So thank you. Oh, because they're part of it. <laughs> having us host. And Justin. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Well, now I'll give it back to you. Oh, thank and you. I would have edited. <laughs> I just lazily sent my whole bio. Um, <laughs> I also sometimes try to have fun here. <laughs> sometimes I speak a little musically. Apparently, Zoom believes I am playing music right now. Um, <laughs> so, but yeah, it's always fun like that. So, what I'm going to talk about today, this is wonderful that this is such a dedicated to open source group because this project is all about community working with people at all levels, just the general public, PhD, biologists, and everything in between and not in between, um, and how we could all come together and do some data analysis. So this all began with the Field Museum. So here we are at Roosevelt, but just a mile away down the road is the Field Museum of Chicago. And if you've been in there, you see a lot of beautiful displays. You know, giant dinosaurs, um, tiny little plants, everything that you could think of. But in addition to everything that they have on display publicly, they have vast, vast quantities that is not on display. So the entire top floor, it's dedicated to research. It has um, these rows and rows and rows of file cabinets full of specimens that have been collected over the past hundred or so years um, that people looked at and labeled and put away. And so one big thing that they really want to do, and you'll see here, uh, this is uh, Dr. Matt von Conrad, he's the head of their herbarium, and he is so passionate about plants. He really wants to get everyone to fall in love with plants as much as he's fallen in love with plants. And the particular kind of plants that we have been looking at are called microplants. You might say that couldn't possibly be a technical term and you'd be right, they made it up. Um, but it means exactly what it sounds like. They're very, very tiny. So you see here um, in this image, he's holding up a specimen. It's got a branch. Each of these has little tiny leaves and little tiny lobules. They're, you know, about yay big, like the size of a little bit of Parmesan that's on that pizza that you're eating right now. Um, very, very small. So that's the piece of things that we're gonna be focusing on today. And he has worked with other scientists at the Field Museum 
uh, to try to increase public's interest in science, but also not just have the public work passively by sitting around looking at science, but have the public be actively a part of generating science. So how could you get people to help create new science or help contribute to scientific discoveries? So this was a big idea. Part of that, they have a bunch of interns that come every summer. They help them digitize their specimen collection. They help them with displays, all of this other stuff. And I want to credit all of these biologists and biology associated people. Um, the big one being that, uh, another big one being Tom, who is his frequent collaborator on these projects and my collaborator um, and Heaven Wade who works to bridge the gap between biologists and my students. So all three of them worked intensely with my students. I don't have pictures of any other biologists. Uh, full disclosure, these are math and computer people right here. I have a lot of pictures of math people. Um, but in addition to all of the biologists there, there's also a program called Zooniverse. Have any of you heard of it? It is a platform for doing community science. If you go to their webpage, it says people-powered research. It is run out of the Adler Planetarium, which also is right down the road from us. And it sponsors things like, um, I think it's called like a galaxy identifying one where you can look at galaxies and identify their shapes and all of this stuff. And so Matt and Tom came up with a plan to put a bunch of their specimens online on Zooniverse. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at Roosevelt, we really wanted our math students to have some real, real life experience doing research. Get some data, play with it, see what happens. There is a program that is sponsored by the Mathematical Association of America and the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics called PICMAP. So preparing for industrial careers in math. And we joined it. So professors Cohen and Lynn got some training on how to create a class and run a class. And they started doing that. And after a few years, uh, Steve was like, Melanie, why don't you take over? And I was like, yes, this will be fun. So 2018, I took over and Steve had been doing some work with Matt. And so we kind of inherited a data set and the start of some project work. So I had motives, which are a little bit different from the biologist motives. I really wanted my students to get some data science skills, not textbooks, you know, sort of problems. You know how like in textbooks, you'll have problems like, oh, you know, what's six divided by two and it comes out to three and that's a beautiful even number. But how often does that happen in life? And life things are messy. So I wanted them to deal with some really messy data, some real stuff, see all of the ins and outs of what comes out. But I also wanted it to be useful. So not just answering a problem and checking it in the back of the book, but then to come up with a result, something that someone could use, maybe some tools some people could use. And you know, with this project, I um, haven't told you what the project is yet, quite, but essentially it's a test run to see if this is something that could be scaled to other museums, larger data. So that's something we all kind of wanted to find out. These are my students. It's a lot of students. Um, some of them worked with me in spring of 2020, which everyone knows is the most relaxing semester to ever have taught. Um, <laughs> that semester, going long. you can see, um, I got pictures of my 2020 students before the pandemic. And then my 2021 class was all on Zoom. I don't have pictures of them. And then my spring 2022 class, we were back in person. Woo -hoo. <laughs> and that's what these groups of students are. Um, many of them are math majors, some are actuarial science majors, some are computer science majors, data science majors, things like that. I, I have one economist in there too. Woo um, give you a <laughs> shout out there. Um, but what were we working? Okay, so there is a task and can I get it to not show who's talking? Sorry. I put in a QR code in case you are curious, but I see that Zoom is covering up a bit of it, so maybe it will not work for you. Um, what happened was at the museum, they had an experiment. 
It was a kiosk about as big as the surface of this view. You can kind of see for scale this. Um, and they would show pictures of these microplants, zoomed in quite a lot. You can see sort of the scale, 0.1 millimeters is about that big. Um, and people could measure them. Now, I don't have the kiosk here, but I do have a, an online version. So here, I'll make this smaller. Anyone that wants to play along on your phone, you can. Um, feel free to enjoy yourself. It's a really quick thing to do, honest. Um, you don't have to, but it is quick. Because um, being designed for a museum, it's the sort of thing that someone comes up to it and says, oh, what's this? Huh. Measuring leaves, where do they come from? Oh, look, this is from New Zealand. Oh, like hobbits. Okay, let me try measuring these things. And they would draw with their finger on the screen little X's to measure the lengths and widths of them. Um, the kiosk itself would tell them if they were making right angles or close to right angles, it would give them those angle measurements. The version that you can link to on your phones doesn't have the full functionality of the kiosk. Um, but it's a very close approximation. So let's see. I'm going to show people at home. What would happen is people would get, you know, a little tutorial like, oh, we're going to measure these lobules. Here are their sizes. You're going to draw a line across the widest section, which is maybe that, and then the length make a little cross, repeat it all the time on the good ones, especially only some of them are good. Some of them are blurry. Some of them are cut off. You know, we don't want to all of them. We just want the good ones. And then, you know, you can move things around. You can tap stuff. So here, for example, I could say, well, this looks pretty good here. Yeah, that looks kind of nice. Oh, I'm sticking out a little here. Maybe I want to slide it down a little. Let me adjust that. And if you've ever been to a museum, you might have noticed there are a couple kinds of people. There are people that go around very carefully reading all the details. And then there are kids that run around and slap buttons. Have you seen this? The button slapping? So we didn't really know what was going to happen with this. Were we going to get good data? Were you going to get handprints? I don't know. There, there could be a lot of different stuff going on. So we did know that some of the data we got would definitely be terrible. And some of it should be good. Could we separate the good and the bad? And what would it mean for it to be good or bad? Or how could we separate it? You don't really want to go in and look at it all. Um, here, I'm going to be lazy and just draw the two and click done. And then it shows you another picture, you can do another picture, and so on. Let me get back to here. It's nice and big. Make this a slideshow again. Okay. So could the public give us actual good data that we could really use? Um, what percent of it would be good? <laughs> would we get, you know, 10% good? <laughs> would it be something we could actually filter out? Um, and would it really be the case that it's just the kids running around slapping the kiosk, whereas the adults, proper that they are, would go around, read it carefully, and just measure it very carefully? Is that what would happen? So here's an example. Um, we did have a way of getting demographics for one piece of the museum, but it was just self-reported. So we had a fair amount of adults, a fair amount of kids, a fair amount of people that did not want to disclose their age, whether they were an adult or a child, and some not exactly teens, 11 to 17. So that kind of demographic data was being collected here at the kiosk in the Science Hub. So Science Hub's on the first floor of the Field Museum. There's a docent there. They can help you out if they want, or if you want them to. But, you know, you also don't have to work with them if you don't want to. Um, and the kiosk was located down there for a while. Prior to being down there, it was located in, in an exhibit hall uh, for a specimens exhibit, and that did not have people helping you. It was just there next to, I guess, a lot of us, um, hoping someone would notice it and 
do some data on it, but unknown to the people doing it, hiding in the background were biology interns with clipboards taking notes on what they perceived the ages of the people doing the experiment were and the time that it occurred. Were their times highly synchronized? Well, they, they were, you know, ordered, right? So the first was first, the second was second, and so on. Um, were they great at telling people's ages? I don't know. Um, did they all use the same sort of notation as one another? No, um, not at all. So <laughs> we had a completely separate file for that. Um, but we wanted to know, did people do differently in these settings? And could this work in a museum? You know? So in the background of the kiosk, these are more math students, um, kind of the background of how it's working is, there were a collection of these images and the kiosk will randomly put an image on display. Um, it's just randomly sampling from there. It repeats some images. So if you really love this and wanted to stay there for half an hour doing images, you would get some repeats. Um, in the code, there's a way for it to retire an image if an image has been shown a lot of times. Um, it's not clear that that functionality was really used, but you could set it up to say, oh, after 100 people use this image, just don't show it again. That, that's plenty. Um, and if someone wants to add more images to this kiosk, they can using the Zooniverse website in the background. Okay, so they could add more images that will get displayed there. At the end of the day, what you can do is download a file. And when I say end of the day, I mean end of the couple of months. Download a CSV file. And what it has is each time a person went to that kiosk and measured things. So say they're measuring this image, they're doing like five leaves on it. There's a CSV file and there's one line that has all five leaves. It's in a JSON format with lots and lots of parentheses and such. Um, and it has the time. The kiosk itself also has a second CSV file for the survey on people's ages. You might say, why are they not together? Why? Why did we not start with plates? Who knows? These things happen. <laughs> but we had these two files. The kiosk also wanted people to know, hey, you've been sciencing. Good job, people. Look, we have kept track of this, this leaf roller. It has measured your line and it says it had endpoints. If X1 was at two, Y1 was at 527 pixels. So that was one endpoint. Another endpoint was X2 at 720 pixels. Another was Y2 at 528 pixels and so on. So it's telling you the endpoints of all the segments. And from this information, it's really easy to compute the lengths of a segment or the width. Um, if you have a couple of segments, you can see if they intersect, right? It's not immediate, but it's not too hard to do. You can find out the angle between them. So those are all things we could do. But with the CSE recorded um, demographics for the ones in the science hub and the specimens exhibit having the intern recorded things, you know, we had to merge a couple of files. So this was one, you know, rather small, but kind of important problem for my students to play with. Um, so the intern records had to be converted to a uniform format, right? We had to take their statement that a mom and her two little kids were there. What does that mean for ages? Maybe, should that be children? Should that be an adult? We have a category called family. That seemed okay. That is not the same as the categories used in the other one. So it's really not precise comparison, right? But it is, you know, within itself reasonable. And these were converted, these were converted into nice, nicer files, and we matched them with the time steps. So that was the first part of our data processing. This gave us some nice overall file. Okay. What were we seeing when people had an image like this? Well, 
Not everyone made lines that intersected. Is this first one gonna be good at all? No, that's terrible, right? You can see if two lines intersect or not. And if they don't, you just wanna throw that out. That is no good. The second one, 33 degrees, that is nowhere near 90 degrees. We're gonna toss out that egg. It is too bad. This third one, 88.6 degrees, that's a 90 degree angle. I mean, not really, but almost. Anything above 80 degrees, that's pretty right to me. We'll take it. Um, so these ones were fine, but we pitched the other two. And that was very objective. You could just objectively pitch them. Yes, are you raising your hand? Are you gonna, you may answer this question later, but how did you uh, measure that? degrees did you use a image recognition program or so mathematically if you have two line segments um you can they're kind of like little vectors right yeah. yep and there's a formula for angle between two vectors that you can do with like a dot product you can also do one yeah, the dot product one's the best one and like a inverse trig function so yeah so yeah it's it's math <laughs> yay <laughs> a little plug for math <laughs> um, we don't need to break out the hard <laughs> no, <that's laughs> for great. that one. Um, so this was good. So this was like our first throwing out of data. So if there are no intersections, we tossed it completely. Missing data, if the angle was small, tossed it, it was bad data. All the rest was valid data. That was stuff that was good. So the missing data, you know a person did a bad job, the bad data, Maybe they were trying, we're not sure. Um, it is important to note that when we have multiple logos, we had a few things going on. Um, in all of our images, they're roughly the same size. They're not perfectly the same size, but if we wanna find sort of the average size of one of these, we can. It's not really important to the biologist to say, oh, here's an image that has one whose length is 100.1 and this one is 100.2. The important thing is to say, okay, the, this image, the lengths are approximately 100, you know, plus or minus five. So that was one of our assumptions. We really didn't want people to measure these weird globules outside or little half leaves, um, but people did. And if you're measuring a weird globule with an X, that previous stuff we did is not gonna get rid of it. You know, you can have a beautiful 90 degree X over this weird globule. So we kind of needed another way of getting rid of the bad stuff. <clears throat> um, because here, this is all the data for this particular picture. You can see this little leaf here. You can see a bunch of random stuff on the outside. Uh, you can see a bunch of people trying to measure this thing up here. Maybe some back here. What in the world is going around here? I don't know. Um, and you can kind of tell on here, the blue circles are the children. The red triangles are the 11 to 17 year olds. The black squares are the adults. So even some adults are doing random stuff out here. And the yellow diamonds that you don't see as well are people that skip their age. So some of them are here, some of them are out in the wilderness. Okay, we went with democracy. We decided uh, to do something called an IQR cut. How many of you have heard of those before? Some of you? So interquartile range. Um, so pretty much what you do is you, you look at your data, right? You've got your lengths. So first we're gonna start with a bigger, bigger measurement will be like our length. Um, and you order the lengths, right? So you've got a maximum length, a minimum length, the median, that's the halfway point, and then split those in half. So Q3 and Q1. So the middle half of our data is between Q1 and Q3. That's like, yes, this is the average stuff. And I wanna get rid of outliers. So I'm gonna say outliers are things that are more than one and a half times this distance away from that Q1 or that Q3. So this kind of cut will always keep at least half the data. It's just gonna get rid of stuff that's way out there. So it's only gonna get rid of far away. It's not a very fancy cut. 
it is a cut that is going to depend on the data you have. So if 10 more people came and measured an image, and then I tried to apply the cut to that bigger data set, there might be things I keep that I hadn't kept before or things that I tossed that I hadn't tossed before. So it's, a, it's not subjective, but it kind of is and that it depends on the data. So we did that. This is what happens after you do those cuts. It looks good, doesn't it? Oh my goodness, we got this little leaf. We didn't get any of the stuff outside. We didn't get this big globule here. We got one kind of going off the edge a little bit person measuring this little guy up here. But that doesn't matter if I'm trying to figure out that, you know, average length and width, because that's similar length to this. You know, this really did a great job of catching the leaf. We wanted to know though, was this similar to our expert? So we had the expert measure three of the lengths multiple times. So the same image a bunch of times because have you, you know, you've now just done touch screens on your phone. How precise is that? Yeah, not super precise. You know, no. it's kind of okay. It's not great. Uh, it's gonna be pretty similar. So we, we had him do this with three images, you know, use one to sort of determine the IQRs. Um, this is what that looks like with the expert measurements, the experts in green. You can see that that's the same, essentially. Um, and when we looked at it, did this really make a difference? So this is my numberies, well, one of my numberies slides. Um, the expert had a major axis length, so the longest one was a, about 143, standard deviation of about three. Before we did the IQR, my public standard deviation was like 84. 84 is a big number for a standard deviation. <laughs> Over your life, it's 143. Um, but after the IQR, that standard deviation got a lot smaller because I removed outliers. Um, you'll notice that the expert is close to the public within one of the public standard deviations. But the public is within like two expert standard deviations on the length. And the other one, it's even better. You know, this is about 94. This is 96. That's, you know, on a touch screen, that's the same number. It's way better than 117. And it wasn't just that image. You know, you can look at a bunch of these before the cuts, after the cuts. Uh, the cuts really cleaned it up, although this one, they people really like that little image there. But it, it really did a nice job visually. And so as a teacher, this was something that was really nice to have my students do when I was teaching on Zoom. I could have them work in little groups and have the little groups have an image and do a little analysis of their one image, their one little mini data set. So you've got a data set, you've got a data set, you've got a data set, you've got a data set. You're working with your new friends, see what you get. And I can help them like with how you get through this. When I was in the middle of pandemic Zoom and working with general students, we were just doing some Excel because the pandemic was kind of a difficult time <laughs> to be teaching over Zoom. Um, but that was okay, because that's what some of my students would do. Um, a lot of the cleaning of the data to get it to a form that we could do. Um, some of my, one of my computer science students really likes PowerShell. Let's use PowerShell for that. Um, I, yeah, right. Data science. <laughs> exactly. Other, other semesters, they've been like Python, Python, Python. Um, some of them love R. So, you know, we got a list of what tools people use. So, please eat more pizza. <laughs> I'm just going to draw attention to you. Anyone at home, it's your turn to eat another piece of pizza, wherever you can acquire one. Um, we wanted to scale this up to the whole data set, right? So I, up to this point, I just had students working on some individual images and we're like, this seems like this technique works really well. We have tried it on ones, we've looked at the data and I really wanted to emphasize to my students, data is not just numbers, it has meaning. And when you show it with the image, you can really see 
what is going on. Like I showed you guys those pictures and you're like, yeah, yeah we can see where we're hitting leaves, where we're not. Um, some of my students are going to be actuaries or they're actually actuaries now, they've graduated and pivot tables and getting great at that was really good for them. Others of them are computer scientists and are computer scientists right now and software engineers and things like that. And Python was great for them. So I had a group that did pivot tables, a different group doing Python, and then some that just took one image that had 150 data points and did it manually. They were using Excel, but you know, explicitly typing things in. So it's not, not manual, but you know, not so much relying on pre-existing stuff. So that we could make sure we actually got the same thing with everyone. And we did, it was really good for debugging. This is like a nice dealing with a big group of students debugging thing. Um, and we saw, yeah, this big data set, only 1% had really awful data where stuff was missing and not intersecting and whatnot. But 29% had terrible angles. 10% um, were outliers for my IQR. And 60% passed those IQR cuts. And you saw from the images, not all of them were on the right leaves. Some of them were on the wrong ones. But by and large, they were. And they did give a good you know, average size. We checked how people did in different age groups. And yeah, the adults were the best. But the kids were good. You know, um, in the exhibit where no one was helping and some of the kids were with family and some of them were listed as kids, it was 41% or 61% for families. When they were labeling themselves as kids, it was 50%. So there's a good chance that the families and the kids here were maybe what would have been labeled as kids in the other one. That was good. People that don't like to give their age are not as good. That, <laughs> actually is kind of interesting because if you are designing something for a museum and you ask a very brief survey question, like what is your age? That's kind of a way to filter out people that don't care or don't care as much, right? Because asking if you're a kid or a teen or an adult is not really personal. You know, it's not like asking, are you 65 or, you know, whatnot, where it might have some meaning. Um, so I thought that was psychologically very interesting. Uh, as you might expect, people did a little bit better when there was some around that could help them, but not a lot better. People were fine on the exhibit without a helper. So that, that was really interesting to us. Um, we did look at the data. So there were 74 images that had been cycling through this. Three of them still had really big standard deviations after our pets, and we wanted to know what was up. All of those had very small numbers of measurements, and this is one of them. And what happened was people were getting this beautiful leaf, this lobule, but they were also trying this big guy behind it. If you have only six people doing that, and you're keeping the middle half, which is three of them, are you really gonna see the outliers? Not necessarily. So you might need to have more people doing this. That might be a big help, but also, you know, maybe some of these images are just a little tricky for a 30 second intro in a museum. That's okay. So overall, these are my students again. Uh, we had my students give talks, uh, explain what microplants are and all of that. They gave, you know, those, they made posters, they did some writing assignments, uh, they used macros, PowerShell, Python, all this business, Excel on little tiny data, stuff with big-ish data, not super big, but you know, thousands. Um, but really the thing I really cared about was the idea that the data has meaning, right? Um, I know a lot of people talk about math and they're like, oh, that's just a statistic or whatever, but None of this is just a statistic. It all has something going on with it, right? And that, that's really important in these analyses. If you just do an analysis and are not really looking at what stuff means, it can really go astray. So I really wanted to emphasize that to my students, um, just the importance of visualization.
So that is that experiment. I want to check the time casually as though you can't tell that me saying I'm checking the time is a thing. Oh, this is great. So if you're curious, I can show you the next phase. Brief. The next phase, new data types. This is where we're looking at reproductive structures. Yeah, what makes a plant have a male reproductive structure, a female reproductive structure, or maybe both? Um, the female ones are these long guys. The male ones are these little blobs. Uh, if it has neither, it's sterile. Uh, these are also microplants. You can kind of see some of these little lobules here and the sorts of things people have been measuring in the previous experiment. This is also on Zooniverse, if you're curious. We also had people looking if things were denuded or not denuded. So did the leaves really cover the stems or not? Uh, did they branch in a regular fashion, irregular fashion, or yeah, was the picture just one stick? No, nothing's branching there. This new piece is a fundamentally different data type than the previous experiment. It's categorical data. Um, you're just saying, hey, is it A, A, B, C, or D? Or in some of these, denuded, not denuded, or not sure. You cannot filter out uh, bad stuff in the same way. So our initial analysis was showing that it was really hard to get good answers with these two, the branchings and the denuded, not denuded. For this piece of the experiment, I'm gonna show it to you. Um, let's see, have it on another tab. Not you, not you, you, ha ha. The reproductive structure. There's nothing going on in this one. It's sterile, sorry. This one's blurry, but this one. You can see this has like a female structure here. It's kind of got that long guy we saw before. When I click that, the next thing it wants me to do is draw a rectangle. That's more work than just multiple choice. Ha ha. And I want to get the whole thing. Oh, I want to get it right there. Is it on the side of the branch? Is it at a tip of the stem? Is it not sure? What do you think? Kind of. Oh no. I'm gonna click not sure. Um, I also could say, well, let's let's look at the tutorial. Tutorial, will you tell me what's going on with that? Let's see, female, that's good. Male, that's fine. Both, that's fine. Sterile, that's fine. Yeah, draw pictures, that's fine. Okay. Terminal's here, lateral is there. Oh, it looks maybe lateral. Okay. I'll click lateral. Okay. So you can see that's kind of a little more involved than just clicking three things. Um, so we actually, one thing we noticed is we were getting better results from these. Um, this is still in progress. So I went, instead of telling you what we're doing next, I just wanna show you a little bit of the behind the scenes of Zooniverse. This is what it looks like behind the scenes of that page. This. You have your, your world, you know, you say what's going on, you tell what's going to happen. Um, you can tag stuff like, hey, this is a bio one. You can design a tutorial, hopefully a good tutorial. Um, but there are places where we can export data from. So if I want to see what's going on, I can export my data, I can download it, it's kind of big from here. Um, you can look at the workflows and see, hey, how do we want to finish it? Do we want to end it with retirement? Do we want it to be active or not? This inflated sacks, they're like, no, <laughs> not doing that one. <laughs> um, and you can see what's going on. So you have a lot of background to change things. Um, the subject sets, when you upload files, 
you can click on it and it has a bunch of images in it. You can look at the images there. So this is kind of the behind the scenes stuff. Um, to see what images are good. One thing we noticed in this more recent thing, because there are three different classifications, some of the images are really terrible for one of the classifications, but okay for others. Um, that made it messy. So there's a lot going on kind of behind the scenes there. So let's see. I would like, sorry about that. I do, I'll keep it again. These are some things we're looking at, how good these classifications are. Is it even possible for the experts to be consistent? Um, not always. <laughs> uh, could we use a neural net to try to classify it based on public data? I have some students working on that now. They're very close to running it, and I am very curious. I think after spring break, I'll get to see what they get. Um, and Matt is trying to train chat GPT-4, which takes images, to classify specimens. That seems interesting. I don't know where that will go. Um, it's hallucinating some, but it also seems to know a fair amount of biology. So as far as I can tell, it sounds like it's like a bio intern that stayed up too late and is two in the morning and they've had a lot of Mountain Dew. That's the quality of chat GPT-4. Um, but it's still pretty good. So a bunch of people got funding for this at the Field Museum. And I'm, class I'm listing this here, NSF, good job, thank you. Um, please keep funding the Field Museum. All the stuff I have to say. Do you have questions for me? There are a question about the angles. So yes. what angles or what range of angles would be bad ones? Anything up to 80 degrees. Up to 80 degrees is bad one. Yeah, because it's also the case that once you, so like, this is bad, right? This is not a length and a width. It's getting pretty good. Oh, this is pretty nice. You might think to yourself, well, what about 91 degrees? Well, if it's 91 degrees on one side, it's 89 on the other. So we're always taking the angle that's up to 90. I'm mentioning that because that's actually what my students thought. Not that that's what you did for some um, and we could have set it at 85, but 80 seemed about right for a museum. Very close to How did you measure that you didn't divide like this special device to detect the angle? No, we used uh, formulas like for vectors. So you, if you have two points, you can create a vector between them, right? So the displacement in X and Y. If you dot the vectors, um, that gives you something that's proportional to their lengths. And also, I think it's like a cosine of the angle, sine of the angle, one of those two. Um, I, I always have to look it up if it's been a while. So, cosine? <laughs> um, and then you just divide, inverse cosine it, get an angle. So if that's you can code that in, right? You're not doing that by hand. And that works pretty well. If it has some rounding error, who cares? Yeah. Uh, there's this. Uh... Ernest, uh, it was nice seeing how good the analysis could be of the, the initial data of the, you know, drawing the two lengths with lengths. Was that, was that part of the design of the interface that certain scientists presented it knew that the resulting coordinates could be easily processed and all layers could be excluded? Was that sort of part of it or was it just a happy accident that your students were processing? That is a good question. So prior to the kiosk in the, new, in the museum, there was a web version of this. That web version is the one that you were playing with on your phones. And that web version did not tell people the angles. So this was part of the idea of how could we get people to do a better job easily. And that was displaying it on the kids. Yeah. Now, uh, I saw that you were using multiple different sources of, of the data sets to bring that all together and treat them a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if there was any like metadata that you were collecting on like device type, because I could see someone you doing this on, you know, a, a physical mm -hmm. laptop or desktop. 
doing a much better job than I was able to do on my little phone, right? Uh, and I was interested yeah. to, you know, hear if that played into anything. For this particular experiment, no, because it was all on the kiosk. Mm. So the kiosk was our device. But for the web one, it could matter because on a web, maybe I'm on a touch screen computer and I can touch and get it to do stuff. But right now I'm not on a touch screen. So I'm using a mouse. Um, oh, hey, it's just asking for a question. Oh, my. Um, but the mouse is a little different, mm -hmm. right? The mouse. Doesn't cover up as much of the, you know, screen. And right. It's a, the, the point of the mouse is a lot tinier than my fingertip. Yeah. So, yeah, you very well could get differences in precision with that. And there's a sense that if we like zoomed in on the pictures more, maybe we'd get more precise answers, right? Is there metadata on the like optics and stuff of the pictures as well? Because I was thinking like if you have, you know, the, the pixel coordinates, mm -hmm. you could theoretically, you know, convert that into a, a real measurement. Yes, there is. Um, there was a conversion factor and we were able to do that. They were actually, the conversion factor was weirdly kind of close to one to get some, you know, micrometers, millimeters, something like this. Um, micrometers. Um, but there's also a program that's used in biology sometimes called ImageJ that you can play with that is for getting very precise measurements for like slide data or biological data. It's available online. I, possibly the National Institute of Health, one of these national institutes yeah. developed it. So you can get high precision things, yeah. right? Thank you. Sure. Yeah. When you were using chat, well, chat GPT, was it only being fed images or was it also fed like, info, like information that was collected from the kiosk or from the web to use that as training data? So the chat GPT thing is only the most recent one and that's only Matt playing with it on his own. He was trying to train it and the thing about ChatGPT is you don't know what it has learned from. So did ChatGPT study uh, Wikipedia articles on plants? And does it inherently know some things about plants or not? And if it inherently knows, does that help it? There's a lot of like black box stuff there that who knows? So he was trying to train it and trying to well, again, like the intern with Mountain Dew at 2 a.m. Um, you're trying to train this intern. Maybe it's working. It's probably getting better. So was he using the, the API at all, or was he just putting image was, by image and then seeing the outputs? I, I believe he copied in some tutorial stuff okay. with the images to try to help train it, um, to try to see if it could figure out what kind of structures might appear, things like that. Yeah. Does ChatGPT take raster and vector images? I do not know that one. And it strikes me that part of what a human being does in kind of looking at a, a raster image is implicitly put a vector structure on it. You know, when, mm -hmm. when you're kind of working with a touch screen. Yeah. And that might be. Okay, I have another one. Um, yeah. it does uh, when you have an input device, um, like 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 a touch screen, do you know the physical? resolution of it like do, do you know the tolerance the, the the limits to its precision we for the um the kiosk we knew exact we knew the exact size of the screen and actually um the image i showed where it shows you the x and y coordinates was literally me uh, at the museum measuring the length and width of the screen and taking a picture so that I would know uh, its length and width. That that was me hacking <laughs> what was going on. There was nothing of that size. Um, if it is on a device like your phone, there is some internal mechanism that's keeping track of the scaling, but I don't know if it's, I don't know how precise it is, right? It can't be super precise. So I don't think this is the sort of thing that would tell you, oh, look, this one, the length is 1.27 times as big as the width compared to this one where the length is 1.25 times as big as the width, that it won't be able to see that. 
But if this one, the length is twice the width and this one, the length is one and a half times the width, that scale should be able to see. You know what I mean? For roughness, yeah. right? And that's, and if you're a biologist, you're looking for different species. And so one and a half versus two could tell you a difference in species. 1.27 versus 1.25. Yeah, that's not enough of a distinction to try to help disentangle what's going on. Yeah. Were there in the image data set, were there multiple species? And was there any difference in accuracy or consistency between the different species? We didn't keep track of um, the full details of those. I think that that information does exist in the background, but that wasn't part of what we were looking at in our analysis, um, it was focused on a particular genus. So that is the level that we got to. Um, so for Ulanium, I've seen a lot of them now, <laughs> but uh, it's not clear exactly how many species of that exist. Um, and it, one thought about this is if you had ways of checking various attributes of it, it might clue you in like, hey, this seems a little different from the others. Maybe we should go and dig down into the genetics on this, right? Because digging down into the genetics of a, a specimen, um, that's a lot more work than measuring a length and width, right? So maybe we can do some of this quick and easy stuff now to tell us where to focus our attention for something that's more interesting. but. Is going to take someone yeah, four hours to do, All right? So that's that's a motivation. But there were seventy four images. That's not really enough to get it at this end. So this again, this is sort of like a test, <laughs> proof of concept. Yeah. Uh, thanks for this talk, Melly. I'm so glad I finally got to see it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what I've been. This is so interesting, to. and I guess this is more um, that I just I really appreciate this emphasis on the data collection. I think a lot of us were so used to hitting an API or getting some data set where somebody else has already done this sort mm -hmm. of work and decided, made certain choices for us. And that's just a nice reminder that sometimes you have to get out there and figure out how to collect your own data about the thing you care a lot about. And so I, I found that a very interesting part of the talk. Thanks. It it's definitely the case that my students had some strong opinions on how the setup maybe could have been done a little better <laughs> for keeping track of the data. Sure. Um, sure. The, the most recent stuff, there are several images that have different file names. You know, so maybe I have a an image like justinplant.jpg, and then I've got justinplant parenthesis one parenthesis close.jpg. How does that happen? Right. Right? <laughs> it's the same one. It's the same. It was uploaded twice. Oh my, do we want it? And my students right now actually are playing with some of that. Like, how do you maybe uh, fold this data onto it in the right way so that you can not imagine these are two Justins, you know, there's one Justin, um, put it together. That's very cool. The universe is, seems like it's a dedicated platform for Data collection from people. Is that yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and is this like a part? Like, are you following a similar approach to like the other projects, or is that how much different is is there between the the they, collection approaches? There are so many things on Zooniverse. So Zooniverse has like everything. <laughs> um, some of it, it's I, I saw some of the projects are like here are some log books from whaling ships. Tell me what these people wrote. You know, so doing things like that. They have some that are live cams of a safari. Tell me when you see a cat wander by. Um, I will click a random one. Does anyone have a favorite category? The log books really should yeah. sounds cool. <laughs> it will chat. Oh no, this is vocalizations. Uh, Can you tell how many whales sing? Can you? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Here are some sound files. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's just... Look at this. 
Man, they could be loud. That's pretty cool. Snapping shrimp? <laughs> Snapping shrimp. Boats, okay. Maybe you want to learn about how whales sound? Yeah. Okay. Let's go. Let's see what we think. <laughs> that, that was stuff going on. It's definitely not nothing. It's definitely not nothing. Uh, uh, I'm back whale sounds. Let's see. What, what were the shrimps sounding like? I don't know. Well, let's see. Um, I don't know the spectrogram. Okay, let's listen to it. Did we hear that? I think we heard. Oh, I think it's boat and whale. That's what they're whale. trying to do. Yeah. Okay, we definitely got a whale. Okay, well, we'll, we'll just remember that. <laughs> That's a shrimp. Okay. It really does. No boats and shrimp sounded the same. No, it's, it's the same. It looks like the Blade. same file. It looks like this. It kind of like, like, it's not all that. Yeah. Fat. So I was like, you know, you think the way it would avoid it. Huh. But if he exactly. thinks it's a school of shrimp, then. <laughs> 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 Did you hear shrimp? But we got a whale. Did you think there was something else? Maybe you other? All of the above. <laughs> uh, <laughs> see, do you think I'll just click other, I guess, and we'll sort of see. Yeah. Forcing? Oh. Sound like multiple whales? Yes. I think it did. Just look at the spectrum. It kind of looks like forcing. Okay, that in talk. We'll try to talk. Um, tutorial of shrimp. Found some shrimp, guys. Oh no, it's a whaling boat. Found it the same. We were a little confused. Okay, that's my comment. Um. <laughs> now they know. <laughs> so the insights into that. Oh, no. This is life. It's kind of fascinating, huh? Mm -hmm. So there could be scientists here who need you all, right? Um, they, there are a lot of things going on. Where's Walleye? Oh, that's <laughs> um, oh it's a, this is the comment. So people can talk about things. Popular tags are fish, apparently. Um, Looking for a fish. This is like the whole thing on Zooniverse. It's, it's awesome, right? So, you know, if it's something you're interested in connecting with people. You know, here's a, this researcher is a PhD student in biology. They want to help him find fish. They want to train an ML model to automate it. Can I just ask one yeah. more thing? Like, as a biologist, like, you work at many orders of magnitude. And so, the thing you showed, like somebody just assessing an image, uh, you know, is at some zoom level, it's at some level of magnification. Mm -hmm. Do you, like, as a biologist, do you have a sense for how, like, physical intuitions about the world change at each order of magnitude? Like, like, like things like surface tension or osmotic phenomena, what have you, like, starts mm -hmm. to matter in different ways? So, disclaimer I'm not a biologist. But my sister is, um, or whatever that. Uh, if you see another Favarsky around doing biology, it's my sister. Uh, I don't know if people really have a good sense of it, um, because definitely water behaves really different at different scales. Um, but unless you've watched like videos of it, if you, there's a a movie called Microcosmos that's a bunch of little buds, it has a very dramatic dung beetle rolling a ball of dung up the hill. It, it, it's fascinating. We really see these different effects and scales, but with our naked eye, we don't see that so much. So I don't know if people quite feel it the same way. Like the, these pictures uh, of the microplants, if you 
you know, until we saw them in person, you know, this is the microplant and probably just like the tip of my mouse here is how big those little slides were, right? So it's very tiny. I don't know that people really feel that, you know, like it says the scale, but do you, I don't know if you feel it. It, do, it also, it does affect how they reproduce and all that stuff though, because of the scale and how things move. That's the extent of my knowledge. Other questions on things or that? Um, you use both like, you know, Python and Excel, even PowerShell in some cases to kind of parse and get results from some of this data. Mm -hmm. um, as kind of the person who was kind of like overseeing all the students and them using these different tools, are there any kind of characteristics or shortcomings or, you know, strengths that you found in the different groups? I would say one thing that I've noticed was different students had different learning curves. And so if a student comes up to me and is like, mm, well, Python's useful, but I feel really comfortable with R. I want to play with R. They will get things done about three weeks faster than if they're picking up Python. Um, whenever I had, so like last year I had some students that were like, we don't know Python, we want to learn it. And the first month of the course, they were learning Python. They were really motivated, they were looking at tutorials, like, oh, I want to do this thing. Ooh, and then they were talking with each other and then, you know, they'd ask me stuff and I'd be like, well, yeah, let me help you with, I can debug Python reasonably well. Um, so with that, it, but it, you know, there was a whole month where they were just in learning and some other students were looking deeply at images and stuff from a thing and seeing what was going on there. So if you're doing like the simpler sorts of analysis, looking at specific individual subjects, you can start on that fast. But then by the time the people looking at that were coming up with ideas like, hey, I wanna calculate this or that, the Python people were ready to write things that could do stuff at a scale. So this was something that was kind of interesting to balance, like how fast could they get to a quick point? Um, this semester, I have a couple of students that are just like zip, zip, zip. They're like, it, it's a pair. They're working on neural net stuff together. Um, and that's only possible because they're coming in with uh, some strengths, you know? So. It's kind of an interesting thing in the class. <laughs> you know, what are you going to learn from it? What are you going to take out of it? Um, and it's also kind of a weird class because I don't have a list of topics that everyone is going to take the exact same things out. Some people are going to come out being much better programmers. Right. Everyone's going to come out better than before. Right. Um, but different people are going to grow in different ways. I feel like it's... I'm trying to like fit in a little, like a, a miniature internship for them. If you were in a company, does everyone do the same thing? Right. No. So that's kind of my philosophy on that. Sense. Other questions or anything? There's more pizza. You can politely say.